sure you were expecting a younger face up here today. Uh, I was looking forward to hearing Gannon speak because he is a, an outstanding speaker. And, uh, you know, I've preached to some pretty large groups, and I've preached to some very small groups. And the question is, do you feel closer to God in a small group or a very large group? And, of course, I hope you remember the scripture where two or three are gathered together, there is God in our midst. And I want you to feel that way today, that Christ is sitting beside you, because he really is. It's intimate, and God is right here, and he's speaking to no one else besides you. And my sermon today is entitled, Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. And obviously, this is a time to think about all of God's blessings as we're going to be celebrating Thanksgiving this Thursday. And uh, I really want you to, yes, ask God for what you want and need, because we are God's children, and he expects, fathers expect their children to do that. But most of all, take some time to count your blessings, and thank God from whom all blessings are. Flow. The first thing I want to do is to help you remember the circumstances under which the first Thanksgiving that we celebrate was held. Because like Christmas, God is being pushed out of the memory of what it is all about. First Thanksgiving was held in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1620. And the reason that it was held is all important, but it's now being largely overlooked. It was over 25 years ago, I was assistant superintendent of schools here in Spotsylvania, and one of my responsibilities was to uh, chair the textbook adoption committees. And what would happen is that all the textbooks would be uh, renewed for, I think it was like four years. And so let's say in the case of English, English teachers from around the school system would be selected to serve on this committee along with some administrators, and they would contact the publishers and ask for their textbooks. They would send the textbooks in, the teachers and administrators would look at these books, and they would decide which ones they would recommend to be used in the school system. And when it came to English and science and the foreign languages and math, I didn't do anything except just conduct the meetings. But when it came to history, that was different because I was a history major and I had been a U.S. history teacher. So I paid very close attention to what the publishers were sending. And I read those books very carefully. And this was 25 years ago, and I was horrified with what I read in those textbooks regarding the first Thanksgiving. A number of the publishers were saying that the Thanksgiving was held, the first Thanksgiving was held so that the Puritans could thank the Indians for saving them. That's what was being written 25 years ago. I don't even know what's being written today. I, I shudder to think. Now, I hope that you know that that is not true at all. It's just an obvious attempt to write God out of our, of our history. The Puritans were very strong Christians who lived in England, and they were persecuted because of their beliefs. So they went to Holland, and they were persecuted there. And they decided that it didn't matter where they went in Europe, they would not be allowed to, to uh, practice their religion, to worship God as they saw fit according to their conscience. So they got on these you know, tiny ships, go across the ocean. They really wanted to come close to Jamestown, where the weather was you know, much milder. But because of storms, they were blown up the East Coast, and they ended up landing you know, on the rocky coast of New England. Very, very difficult place to plant any crops. And it was very, very cold there. And so that first year a large percentage of the settlers died. They died of exposure, and they died of hunger. Almost every family had 
members of the family who had perished. As I read, it was really, I think, every single family. They had lost a husband, a wife, parents, children. And yet, at the end of that year, they gathered to pray to thank God that he had allowed any of them to survive so that their little group could continue to worship him and not be persecuted for their beliefs. Now, this is how it all started. How about in Pennsylvania? Who settled in Pennsylvania? Come on, history folks. The Quakers, certainly. These were Christians who wanted to find a place where they could worship God freely. For a long time, Roman Catholics came to Maryland because the tide of public opinion for a while in Europe was turning against Catholics, and so they came to Maryland. Roger Williams and the Baptist uh, ended up going to Rhode Island. In other words, they were people that settled along the coast in the original 13 colonies. They came there for religious reasons. You know, we live in the richest, freest, and the most powerful country in the history of the world. 99% of all the people who have ever lived would give anything to trade places with us. And the reason we have what we have, in my opinion, is because God blessed us and the founding fathers of our country and the people who, who started it all came because they wanted truly to worship God. And you need to be careful because you're not going to read that in many of the textbooks. And you're not going to hear it uh, publicized very much. But remember, our country in the beginning was founded in large measure by people who came because they wanted to worship God and this Thanksgiving holiday that we celebrate goes all the way back to 1620 and a brave group of Christians who had been persecuted everywhere else, put to death. And so they got on these tiny ships and went across the ocean. And there most of them died. But even though they died, many of them, they still gave thanks. Rather than complaining about God, you know, why did you allow this to happen? Which would be a normal response, I guess, for most of us. Uh, and they probably did do some of that. But for the most part, they gave thanks. And we need to give thanks as well. And I want you to just be aware of what this Thanksgiving holiday, what it really is all about, how it started. Okay, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 17, verse 11. Because I want to point out that God expects us to be thankful. There is no excuse for us not being thankful. We, of all people in America, should be thankful. Just one story, and there are many, many stories in Scripture. Luke chapter 17, verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said, rise and go, your faith has made you well. So Jesus is the one who's doing the healing, but he told them first they had to go and present themselves to the priest. And when they did that, they were, in fact, healed. But only one of them returned to give thanks. Now, they, were, they had leprosy, and that was the most dreaded disease of the ancient world. 
And as I said at the first service, if you attracted leprosy, contracted leprosy, you died. And it was a slow, painful, hideous kind of death. The body would be terribly disfigured. And you didn't die right away. It would take perhaps years. And because it was thought to be so highly contagious, you were thrown out of your home. Imagine dying the slow, hideous death and never being touched by another human being again. No one to put his arm around you and, and let you cry on his shoulder or your mother's shoulder. They, they couldn't do that because they knew or thought that they would contract leprosy as well. A lot of the lepers lived in lepers' colonies. Uh, out in the uh, wilderness, they might down be, in, be down in a low area, and people would come by and they would throw their garbage down to the lepers, and that's what they would eat. We're told in Scripture there were some lepers in the cities. Uh, you know, Jesus uh, healed some, but they were alone, and they would be begging on the street corners, and no one would really come near them. And if somebody accidentally did come near a leper, what was the leper expected to do? Unclean. Unclean. And what, was, what did the leper have? A little bell. And he would have to ring the bell. He would have to say unclean, and he would ring the bell so that no one could even come close. Not only would you never be touched by another human being, but no one could even come close to you. Jesus healed these people, these lepers, out of this. He gave them healing. And nine of the ten didn't even bother to come back to thank him. We're pretty thankless people, don't you think? Particularly in America. We have so many things, so much more than most people in the world, and we... And we take them for granted. Uh, you know, I mentioned this at the first service. You know, we're like the teenage girl complaining she has nothing to wear in a closet full of clothes, and a boy claiming he has nothing to eat with a refrigerator full of food. And most of you probably are too young to remember the old Dennis the Menace cartoons in the newspaper. Any of you remember those? They were so good. And my favorite was. Uh, Christmas Day cartoon in the newspaper. And Dennis the Menace is in his uh, living room, and he has toys piled up all around him. They are up probably to his waist. Hundreds of toys. And the caption simply says, is this all? And that's, that's Americans. That's us. We have so much more than anyone else has. And our attitude, God, is this all? We really need to compare ourselves to people around the world to put in perspective how God has truly blessed us. God expects us to be thankful. And we need to thank him every single day. Every day. And this would be a good time to start at the end of this service. Now, finally, I hope you're going to have a blessed Thanksgiving. And uh, I said at the early service, it's really my favorite holiday. Uh, I try to focus on thanking God for all of his blessings. And uh, it's a good holiday to be a man. Because if your wife is a good cook, and if she's willing to cook, you can eat a great meal, sit back and watch a couple of games on television, and it's wonderful. Um, and you can spend some time with your family. The big thing about Thanksgiving is that you don't expect that much out of it. You know, it's just a nice, relaxing day with usually some people that you love, and that's it. You know, compare that to Christmas which can be very stressful. You know, we plan Christmas, we look forward to Christmas, we want it to be perfect, and almost always there's a letdown after Christmas, isn't it? Because it's never perfect. 
you know, we have to make sure we don't miss anybody with the Christmas cards that we're sending out. We have to visit the right people. The tree has to look good. You know, all the stuff that goes on with Christmas. Not Thanksgiving. Just sit back and relax and enjoy probably some family members you're with and just give thanks to God. This Thanksgiving is going to be uh, special for Betty and me. Uh, there are going to be 18 of us who are going to be eating Thanksgiving dinner together in Richmond. Our daughter and son-in-law and our two grandchildren who live in Atlanta that we haven't seen for a year, they're coming to stay with our other daughter in Richmond, her husband, and our other three grandchildren. And then we're all going to eat Thanksgiving dinner at Betty's brother's house in Richmond. Her mother lives there now, and uh, his wife is there, and their two sons will be there. One is coming from New Orleans with his fiance, and the other lives in Northern Virginia with his wife and their two little kids. So it will be, if I've counted, it will be 18 of us. And all we're going to do is just eat and talk and relax and just take it easy. The only one problem is that the nephew that lives in Northern Virginia is a big Dallas Cowboy fan. And the Cowboys are on uh, always Thanksgiving afternoon. So he will have that game on TV and we have to be polite and watch it. After the first service, someone who was sitting right over there came out and said, and if the Dallas Cowboys lose, I'm blaming you, and I'm, and I'm never coming back to this church again. But th isn't Thanksgiving just a nice, relaxing time to spend with people that you care about? Now, I hope this is not so for many of you, but it is so for a great deal, a great many people in the first service. I'm sure many of them would say, yeah, but I wish the people that I love the most were still alive to share Thanksgiving with me. And uh, I go out to the retirement community at Chancellor and I preach the 11 o'clock service once a month this year, this week, month for various reasons. I've done it twice. And most of the people that come to the service are women because their husbands have, have died. And they're going to be spending Thanksgiving. I don't know if their children will come, but uh, the men that they love will be gone. We took prayer concerns. It was, uh, I guess, last week when I was there. And six people at Chancellor had died since the last month when I was there. And, you know, they're, they're surrounded by death, and they're not surrounded by people that they love. And so I have to be cognizant when I say it's just a nice, carefree time when you can spend it with the people that you love. And I know that there are folks who are thinking I would give anything to be able to give God thanks with the person I love the most. But the wonderful thing is that God sent his son into the world to die on a cross, that if we accept him as our savior, we can have eternal life. And my favorite phrase that I say all the time and Willard will have to hear three times today Every day we live is not a day closer to dying. It's a day closer to going home. And I say it out of chance for all the time. All those people in their 70s, 80s, 90s, they come in in their walkers and their wheelchairs, and uh, they know their time is limited. And I don't want them to fear death. Those of them who've really given their lives to Christ, I want them to know you know, the final chapter in the book of their life has been written, and it has a happy ending, and they're going home. So perhaps people you love the most will not be spending Thanksgiving with you. Maybe they're somewhere else for whatever reason. Lift them up in prayer. Ask God to protect them, to bless them. If it's a case of having drifted apart Pray for them. Contact them. 
you be the one to break the ice. But most of all, if the people that you love have passed away, if they know the Lord and if you know the Lord, oh, what you have to look forward to. You have an eternity in which to give thanks. And you will be with that person that God has given to you. The best is yet to come. The only real question is, have you given your life to Christ? Have you really accepted his gift of salvation and forgiveness and eternal life? Don't want Christ to have died in vain as far as you're concerned. So I always extend an invitation at the end of the message. And uh, if you're not sure or if you know you've never really taken that indispensable step, I want to invite you just to come and we'll talk together for just a, just a very short period of time. But I want you to make that decision if you think you should. If you haven't joined a church and you'd love to join heirs, I invite you to do that. There was someone visiting at the, two people actually visiting at the early service who, who said that they think they want to join Fairview. And I'm not sure who is members and who are not because I don't know everybody at this service. Uh, we'd love to have you as a part of Fairview. And if you want to recommit your life to Christ and if you want to pray with someone about that, I'd be happy to do it. So let's stand as we sing our closing hymn.